let me ask you today, have you ever had to move? Have you ever had to go from a place of safety and comfort to a place of unknown? What was the most uh, exciting part of that process for you, and what was the most difficult part of that process? I want you to think about that today. I just want to share with you briefly. I grew up in uh, Davenport Avenue in Belrose, Queens, and I lived there pretty much all my life. In fact, I, I moved, I went to college, but I brought back my laundry whenever I came home, so I don't know if that's considered a move. And then when I graduated from college, I actually moved to the basement apartment, finished apartment of my mom's house. So I guess that's not really a move, right? But, but then I, you know, when I got married, I moved to Lynbrook, Long Island, New York, and, and moved into a home. And then my, we got married and my wife moved in. And we were there for 10 years and it was a wonderful place. So I guess that was kind of my first official move. But on February 25th of 2000, Hard to believe it'll be 20 years this February that, that this happened. We packed a U-Haul truck to the, to the hilt. We got in this moving van, and I drove from Lynbrook to Middlebury Center, Pennsylvania, in the middle of nowhere in central PA, and that was the move that was scary and exciting all at the same time. Have you ever had a move that was scary and exciting at the same time? Well, I had that move. And here was the thing, I remember distinctly, it was almost after midnight, and I, was, I got off the state highway, and I got onto this little country road that kept twisting and turning, and there was fog, and I could barely see a few feet in front of me, and we had all of our life belongings in this truck, and I'm driving on this road, and you know what the thought occurred to me? It was at that moment this frightening thought occurred to me, do you have any idea what you're doing? And the thought occurred to me, God, is this you? Is this your call? Are you behind this? Because I was going to become the pastor of the church there in Middlebury Center. I had moved. And, and it just a flood of emotions, a flood of fear overcame me as I drove. It lasted for a few minutes. I got over it. Eleven and a half years later, we got over it. But, you know, have you ever had that moment when you said, Lord, are you behind this? Anyone ever have a moment like that in your life? It could be frightening. We're going to start a sermon series on the life of Abraham called God Faith. And we're going to be talking about Abraham. And we begin the story of Abraham with a major relocation in his life. His relocation was over a thousand miles. And it was all through caravans and a lot harder than our move was with a U-Haul truck. And perhaps, perhaps at some moments in his journey over a thousand miles, he may have asked the question, Lord, what am I doing? Are you behind this? And I want to suggest to you today that the physical aspect of moving in my life, but certainly in Abraham's life and maybe in your life, is also symbolic of the kind of spiritual move. And I want to suggest today that our faith must be on the move, always, toward the promises of a faithful God. I believe as we study the life of Abraham, we will discover that our faith must be on the move toward God's faithful promises for his people. And we'll see that in the story of Abraham. We'll begin the story with an announcement, an announcement that Abraham has been called to relocate his family. We pick up the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And what do we find? We find a man and his family on the move. Now, I just want to say one thing. The story begins by calling him Abram. His name, his given name, was a Mesopotamian name, and it probably came from the sun god of that area, and it meant exalted father. But in Genesis chapter 17, he will be given a new name by Yahweh, Abraham. So he'll go from Abram to Abraham. And Abraham means father of many. We'll talk about what that means as we go through the series. So I'm going to talk about him as Abraham, unless the text says Abram, but don't get too confused. There's just a change of name in chapter 17. So who is this Abraham? 
this Abram that we see in the Scripture. I want to suggest to you today that like Abraham, we must believe in God's promises with our head, our heart, our hands, and our feet. Faith must be engaging every aspect of our lives. First, let's start with our head and our heart, and let's see as the story unfolds in Genesis chapter 12. Look at verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So how does this story start? Abram is in Ur of Mesopotamia, all the way at the bottom of the Fertile Crescent in what is today modern-day Iraq. They worship, he and his family would have worshipped many gods, and somehow, we don't know exactly how, it's not recorded, but he has this vision of the one true God who, who, who reveals himself to Abram. And he says, I want you to relocate. You getting the story so far? So so Abram has to say, is this true? Is this right? Do I really believe this one God is calling me? And and I want you to notice how the Lord, the Lord said to him, so this God is able to communicate with Abram. We don't know whether it was audible through a vision. It was probably a combination of those things in in those days. There wasn't a written Bible, so God had to get Abram's attention. And I want you to notice what God promises. He says, I will show you. Do you believe in a God who can reveal himself to you? Do you believe in a God who can lead you and guide you in life? That's really a question every one of us has to ask. What do we believe about God? Do we believe with our head that he's really there? Or do we just think he's off in the shadows somewhere, sort of like ignoring life? Do you you believe he's really involved in your life? Do you? I will show you. And then he says, I will make you. I will make you into a great nation. Do you believe in a God who can intervene in your life and mine? Who can change us from the inside out? That's what God is claiming to Abraham. What do you believe about God? And then he says, I will bless. And he says, I will curse. Do you believe in a God of grace who is able to bless us beyond anything we can imagine? That's what this God claims to be able to do to Abraham. But do you also believe in a God who is a judge, who can curse, who can condemn if if he chooses? This is really the God that Abraham is 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 confronted with when he has this vision. What do you believe about God? Do you believe that he's there with your head? Do you believe he's there with your heart? Can you trust a God like that? It's really the questions that were asked as we see the story begin to unfold in the life of Abram. And it helps us think about our own lives. Do we have a faith like Abram with our head and our heart? Do we believe in a God who is there, who can communicate with us, who can show us, who can bless us, who can change us? Is that the God you believe in? But like Abraham, we must also believe in God's promises, not only with our head and our heart, but also with our hands and our feet. Look as as the story unfolds. Look at verse 4. So Abraham went... Now, what's interesting in this story is we actually read in Acts chapter uh, 7 that Abram was called in Ur, and then the story says, as we read in Genesis chapter 12, that Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Haran is up in what is modern-day Syria. So the story in Genesis picks up when he has gone from Ur all the way to Haran all the way from Haran. Then he comes down to what is modern-day Israel. That journey, thousand miles. But he does it in two stages. He goes from Ur to Haran. So he goes from modern-day Iraq to modern-day Syria. And then he seems to take a pause. Why? He waits for his father to die. Why? 
well, maybe his father was sick, and the, or maybe there was apprehension on his part to continue the journey. We don't know. But what we do know is he was crossing from Ur, sun god was in charge he was going to haran where they were still that was still the god they believed in but when he crossed into israel modern israel he was crossing beyond all that he was crossing into a whole new land and a whole new god you see abram wasn't just changing his physical location he was changing his spiritual life and allegiance to leave Ur, to leave Haran, and to go to Israel was to forsake the God of his fathers and to accept this new God as the sovereign God. There's more going on than just relocating across a thousand mile terrain. And that's what's happening at this moment. This shows us, though, that believing in this God this God of the universe who can reveal himself to us, who can show himself to us, who can bless us, who can curse us, this God who wants a relationship with us, that we have to believe and we have to show our belief more than just with our head and our heart. It must reflect it in our faith, in our feelings, and in our feet, in our hands. This, this faith must express itself in action. Sometimes God calls us to move from one place to another place. That's really what faith is. And in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, it's called the, the Hall of Faith. It's the great chapter about the faithful people of God. Of course, Abraham has a wonderful section in there about his life. And we read in in Hebrews chapter 11, that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. In so many ways, we'll see in the life of Abraham that he had confidence and assurance in things he could not see. Imagine being asked to move from one place to another and not being able to check with the real estate agent to see what it looks like, to get pictures on your phone to see it and say, that looks pretty good, I guess I'll go there. He had no idea where he was going. In fact, it says in verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. Would you go if you didn't know where you were going? Would you go based on the assurances of God? I'll show you, I'll lead you, follow me. Isn't that enough? Well, God, could I get a picture? Well, God, I don't know if that's enough. But Abraham went. He went. What does his faith reveal? His faith reveals that he believed that God exists. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. With our head, we must believe that there is a God out there who, who wants to be involved in our lives. We have to believe with our head and our heart. But you know what? We have to do more than that. We have to have a faith that moves. Notice what it says. And rewards those who diligently seek Him. Faith is more than just believing that a God exists up there. It's believing that a God wants to guide us and lead us and we would diligently seek Him down here. That's what real faith is. Diligently seeking a God who will reward by His grace and by His mercy. See, our faith must be on the move toward the promises of God. In Abraham's case, it meant physically relocating. It meant spiritually going to another place. I'm going to turn off on the pulpit mic. So I want to ask you today, as we think about moving, physically, spiritually moving in the direction that God has for our lives, I want to ask you three questions today. They come from Chuck Swindoll in his excellent book on the life of Abraham. And these are important for you and I to consider today. First one is, are you seeking God's will deliberately and passionately? 
Are you seeking him? The Bible says that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Are you seeking him? Faith is actively on the move seeking God. Is, is that what you and I are doing today? Let me ask you the second question. If God were to have you leave your comfort zone, if he would tell you to go to an unfamiliar place, would you go? Could you go? Is your faith big enough to allow God to put you on the move? And then he asked this third question, which makes a lot of sense. Are you making obedience too complicated? When you get down to it, obedience and faith are connected. And when, if we say we believe in God and we believe in his promises, the really big question is, so are you moving toward his promises or away from his promises? It is, it, we make it too complicated sometimes. In other words, are you moving toward God in your life or are you moving away from him right now? Ask yourself that question. I've asked myself that question. It, is my faith on the move toward God's promises for my life? Or am I stagnant? Or worse yet, am I retreating? That's the question each one of us needs to ask today. And so Abraham obeyed and went, didn't he? And when he arrives in the land, we see that Abraham has faith that is full of fervor. He is full of faith. And when he arrives in the land, we read in verse 7 that the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Two times he builds an altar. He calls on the name of the Lord. What does that mean? I believe that he is officially saying, I believe in the one true God who revealed himself to me and this land is his. I think he's making a statement. Uh, uh, he's putting a stake in the ground. This land belongs to him. And it has, I believe, ever since that time belonged to, to him and his people. And even today, that's a topic for another day. But he pitches his, his, his stake. He builds an altar. He, he is firm in his commitment. And you know, in one sense, we think that's where the story ends. Abraham moved. He obeyed God. He built altars. And it all ended happily ever after. See, the truth is, like Abraham, our faith is ultimately vindicated, though, not by our fervor. Because we know all too well our fervor can wane. And one of the things we'll see with the story of Abraham is that, boy, his faith and his fervor does waver. If you know anything about the story as we go through it, you'll see that so many twists and turns. Abraham comes to land at 75 years old. There are Canaanites in the land. There's famine in the land. So his faith is immediately tested. Even in chapter 12, he gets to this new land that God gives him, and all of a sudden there's nothing to eat. God, you sent me here for what? So his faith is challenged. And then he has to lie to pretend that Sarah is his sister, protect his own life. And he does that not once, he does that twice. This is a guy who's full of faith. It looks like he's full of fear. And he's waiting for God to give him this promised child that, he, that God says he's going to give him. But his wife is barren and so he takes matters into his own hands and he has a a child through a concubine, and that should have solved the whole story, except it just made things all a lot worse. It just made everything a mess. Finally, Sarah gives birth to Isaac when Abraham is 100. Sarah's just a few years behind. And then he has the son that he loves, and then God says, okay, give him up. So we're going to try and figure out how our faith is tested. When God gives us what we long for and hope, and then he seemingly is going to take it all away, how do we trust a God who does that? So you see, Abraham's faith is up and it's down. It's up and it's down all the way to the death of Sarah and beyond. Abraham lives to 175 years. A hundred years after God calls him from, from Haran, he is now dead. And in those 100 years, we learn a tremendous, a tremendous amount about what faith looks like 
and how it relates to my life and to yours. And here's the one lasting thing we have to get from all of this. Faith should not in the end be measured by our fervor alone. Because you know what? We fail. We fall short. We, I don't know about you, but if, if God's just going to measure me just by my fervor, it's going to be up and down. It's going to be squiggly lines. But here's ultimately what faith is all about. Not by our fervor, but God's faithfulness. You see, the, the, the key to understanding faith is not to understand faith subjectively, like inside of us, measured by us, but objectively measured by the object of our faith. Do you want to know if your faith is good? Don't measure it by yourself. Measure it by the God you have faith in. In other words, measured by the object of your faith. Are you measuring your faith by yourself, up and down, or are you measuring it by your God and his faithfulness to you? And so we see in the end that God is the one behind Abraham's faith. Look back at that promise again in Genesis chapter 12. And I want you to notice the word I. Who's speaking there? God is speaking. And he says, I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Yes, Abraham, you're a champion of faith. But it's only because the God who promises all these things remains faithful even when you're not. And that's the most important thing that we can learn from the story of Abraham. Have faith in a great God. And that makes faith great. And so the Bible presents Abraham as this picture of faith. In just a moment, we're going to gather around the communion table. But I want to try and tie in communion to the life of Abraham. And here's how I'm going to do it. In the New Testament... The Apostle Paul holds up Abraham as the model of faith for us today. And it talks about Abraham that he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Galatians chapter 3. Do you want to have a relationship with God? Do you want to have a sustaining relationship with God? Then follow the example of Abraham. It is all about whether or not God is faithful to you to accomplish his will and way with you and for you. Is God faithful to you? You can trust him. And, and as you believe, as you trust in him, the Bible says you're counted as righteous in him, just like Abraham. See, Abraham becomes the model for us of how to have a relationship with God. It's all about simple trust and faith in the promises of God. Faith is on the move toward the promises of a faithful God. And when you get to the New Testament, what you realize is that the main thing God was doing in the life of Abraham was preparing him to be the person through whom the Savior would come. God was all about that. Oh yeah, he was teaching Abraham lessons and we'll learn from those. But in the end, the bottom line was God was giving him a descendant who would have the descendant, who would have a descendant, who would have a descendant. And when you get to the book of Galatians, Paul says, hey, the bottom line is Jesus came through Abraham. God's desire to bless all peoples and all nations is realized fully in Jesus and so the Bible says that in the end, Abraham was the, was the vehicle through which you and I would be blessed today. That's why the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, that we are the seed of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. If you belong to Jesus, you receive the blessings that God promised to Abraham. 
In the end, God's purpose and plan is fulfilled through Abraham and through his descendants and through Jesus. And through Jesus, we all become children of faith. We have that same model of faith. We reach out to a God who promises to bless us through Jesus Christ and we receive that blessing in our lives. It's all through faith. It's not through works. We rest in the promise of God. So let me ask you today, is your relationship with God based on his promises and Jesus Christ to you? Or are you still trying to make your way up the ladder and somehow attain this kind of righteousness or this kind of ideal life that you're looking for? We believe in a God who comes down. We believe in a God who revealed himself to Abraham, showed himself to Abraham, worked through the life of Abraham to bring about the descendant Isaac, to bring about all the descendants that followed, to bring about the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, the descendant of Abraham. We believe in a God who comes down to live among us, to be with us, and in Jesus Christ, through faith, we receive that blessing of Abraham. We are children of faith. We are children of Abraham for all who believe. So let me ask you today, are you moving toward the promises of God in faith? The faithful promises of God in Jesus. Are you moving toward it? Are you, are you setting your sights to move closer to Jesus today? Or are you stagnant? Or worse yet, are you retreating? Where are you right now in relation to God's promises in Jesus Christ? Is your faith on the move? Or do you need to get the wagon going again?